Good morning, church. Good, morning. Good to see you all. First, I'd like to um, just take a moment and bow our heads and ask God for the Holy Spirit to be here, shall we? Father, in the words of the song that we just so recently sang, we are desperate for you today. We, we cannot get through this day without you and glorify your name. We can get through it, just blunder through it. But we need you to give us compassion. Just give us care. We care at all. To, to give us a, an eye and a heart um, and ears to listen. And, and that all around us we might see those who you want to touch and let them know that they are loved. I ask you that as we've come today, that we might be thirsty for what you have to say and that you will never hear one word from the speaker, but that only people may hear your voice speaking them today, Father, is our desperate plea. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was sitting listening to the songs, which I was so blessed by, thank you so much, um, musicians today, this was... This was truly worship, but I, I, I heard that first song, Hosanna, and it reminded me when, when I was exposed to that word was when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, his triumphal entry. And what are all the people shouting? Hosanna, which means save me now. Of course, they were thinking about saving them from the Romans, but just as surely as they needed to be saved from the Romans, even more so, they needed to be saved from the bondage that we find ourselves in absolutely every single day. Everything we do is tainted by the tempter. And we need deliverance right now. We need Hosanna right now in our lives. I hope that if you came to check off church from your list of stuff that you think God probably wants you to do this week, that you will have come here today and instead really connected with God. I want that desperately. We were singing that song, I'm desperate for you. I want God to breathe through me so that you hear that today. We're right at the end of a series that's entitled Forging Stronger Families. Forging Stronger Families. In this series, we've looked at ways that we can forge stronger families. We've looked at unity, respect, boundaries, and today we're going to take a look at love, which is a little bit daunting. I mean, love is everything, isn't it? Uh, you know, love is the foundation of unity. It's the foundation of respect. It's the foundation of where we put our boundaries and whether or not we'll stick to it, whether we love the person enough to stick to it so that, so that our great love for them surpasses you know, anything else that we might not want to face or, or, or want in our lives. Love is the foundation for it all. And so it was immensely daunting to take a look at how do we build stronger families through love. I... I love the use of the term forge. Didn't say, how do we build stronger families? How do we grow stronger families? But the word that was used in putting this together was forge stronger families. And I've thrown up uh, one of Garen's slides up here that he so aptly uh, shared with us what forge actually means. Uh, forge means it involves heating and hammering, putting things in a fire, and then beating them into shape. Many times, the, the blacksmith, they got on these great big long gloves, and they're holding the iron at a distance with tongs or something else, and just letting it stay in the fire. And sometimes, you and I, would say, whoa, boy, that's going to burn that thing up. But the blacksmith knows how long to leave it in the fire. And I think that this is tremendously significant that we're using the words forge here because forge denotes that something might be difficult or even painful. And yet we leave ourselves there in God's hand 
Because as we look at our next slide, we discover that who God is, God is the one that's forging these families. He is the blacksmith. Unfortunately, a lot of times, you and I, we want to be the blacksmith. We want to be the one that's beating this person to shape and, you know, sort of intimidating this person to do what they ought to do or, you know, skillfully pointing out how they may should have done something a different way. And so we utilize force a lot of times. I found a, a couple of cute little stories and quips that I think illustrate this well. It's sort of like the wife who said, hey, sweetheart, treat me like a queen and I'll treat you like a king. Treat me like a game, though, and I'll show you how it's played. Then there was the cop who radios his sergeant about the domestic dispute. Yes, yeah, Sarge, it seems like this woman shot her husband, see, for stepping on the floor just after she mopped it. So did you arrest her? Well, no, Sarge, not yet. The floor's still wet. <laughs> and then finally, there's a mother who said, I always worry about the safety of my children especially when they're talking back to me. So we love to be the blacksmith, don't we? To beat our kids into shape or, uh, or you know, hold them over the fire just a little bit longer. But when we realize that God is the blacksmith and that God is always love, love, by the way, is not one of his characteristics. God is love, and that is tremendous. Because what we have to simply do is to keep God out there in front. Remember about a month ago I talked to you about discipleship? And, and previous to that we talked about the Beatitudes where the meek shall inherit the earth. When you're allowing God to be in charge, that's being meek. Instead of you being in control, you're allowing God to be the blacksmith. And when you're allowing him to be the blacksmith, you inherit the earth. All of the resources of the universe then are at your disposal. Rather than your just limited resources, your checkbook, your, your, your strength, your stamina, your patience, your kindness, your compassion, all of those are very limited. But if you will be meek and allow God to be the blacksmith, he will take over control. And then what do you have? You inherit the earth. All of the resources of the universe are then at your disposal. So we've used a lot of metaphors over the, over the past few months talking about being a disciple and how important it is to let him be in control. I don't know if you remember, about a month ago I spoke to you and I shared with you things like Jesus is the wagon train scout and that Jesus is the, the, the pilot ship captain to lead us safely into the bay. And then we even talked about the fact that he's this giant mind-sniffing rat that finds the landmine so that we don't step on if we will allow him to be in control. Well, I want to suggest to you another metaphor today, even besides blacksmithing, and that's the shepherd metaphor of Psalms 23. Remember the words there? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of what? Death. What? I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. The blacksmith has you in his hands. So don't think that it's going to be pleasant necessarily all the time. There's going to be some pleasant time. But when it's the blacksmith and he's forging stronger families, and you really want a stronger family, then then you've got to understand that his love will control the situation so that you can rest. Does a calamity hit you? He's the blacksmith. Does it seem like you've suffered too long? He knows how long to hold it in the fire. You know, I get on an airplane every single time I get on an airplane. This, luckily, it's not very often. But I'm usually not afraid. I've never been afraid of heights too much. But I get on an airplane, and, you know, I read the news, and I, you know, watch uh, the news when these things crash. And I say, God, you know these things go down, but you're my papa. And 
Everything is yours, and you've got infinite power. So since you're my papa, that's the love part. See, the papa part's the love part, isn't it? Because of that, I can trust him. Whatever he does, I need not fear any evil because he is with me. So as you forge stronger families, understand that that word forge is real, and there's going to be some pain involved. Pain that's caused, though, by an all-powerful, loving creator. You see, if we just have a powerful God, it's, it, it's not good enough. If we just have an omnipotent, uh, omnipresent God, that's not good enough. If we just got an omniscient God, that's not good enough. It's not good enough until you add the fourth thing, you've got an all-loving God. Then, no matter how powerful he is, he's going to use that power for what? You're good. He's all-wise, omniscient. But if he's all-loving, he's going to use his wisdom to bless you in the best possible way. And if he's omnipresent, that's no good unless he's all-loving, because if he's all-loving, he will never let go of you. He'll always have you, even if you feel the fire. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, folks. As they're flying through the air towards the fiery furnace, what do you think they're happening? Where are you, God? You know, we're the good guys here. We're the ones that stood up for you and told the king we would not bound to his own. What are you doing? And a lot of us, we're always in midair, and we're always wondering, God, where are you? But we got to look at that whole story and then relax and then rest. Might it cause some pain? Bam, they hit the floor of the fiery furnace. Wowie, that hurt. Wait a minute, <laughs> but I'm okay. And then what does the king see? He sees four men in there, one like to the Son of God. Let me tell you, folks, because God is love, forging stronger families may be painful, but all through the pain, you can keep rejoicing, praising God, because you know, you know the family is going to get better. Now, I don't want us to look with such narrow glasses that we only see marriages or parents with kids. We are the body of Christ. God is our papa, amen? And don't think, don't think that if we are getting the gospel right, Satan isn't upset. And don't think for a minute that he isn't going to attack us. And God lets, he lets some of the pain come through because he knows that the, as we go through that pain as a family, allowing God to hold us in the fire, what will it accomplish? It will bring us closer together. It will weld us together and bond us in real unity, not uniformity. I will start to accept you with your differences. I will accept you with different colors, with different genders. I will rejoice that the more different we are, I praise God more because the more he is showing his love through our love for each other. When a visitor comes through that door, Love ought to be dripping from us. We don't care what kind of sins they have. We don't care what kind of culture or religion they come from. We don't care how different we are. God has not put us or given us the job of correcting people. If you look it up, you'll discover that the job of convicting people of sin belongs to the Holy Spirit. It is our job to bind people to the blacksmith and let them know that they can rest in the fact that he has them, and even though they're going through the fire, he has hold of them. That's what love does. Love doesn't just save us right now from any of the pain. Love looks ahead and says, I could not let this happen, but you and your wife wouldn't be as close later on. I can tell you, folks, you know, everybody that sees Nancy and I tells me how lucky I am. 
because she is the jewel in this, in this operation we got going called a marriage. And because she is stuck with me, no matter what, we are so much closer now than we could have ever been if we didn't ever had any problems. That has caused the closeness. That has caused the unity. That has caused the respect. That's what love does, folks, is love does the hard, the difficult thing because they know, love knows, God knows that afterwards you'll be a lot closer. On the other side of the mountain, you'll be a lot closer than you ever were. So how does God use love to forge stronger relationships? We meet a mountain, we meet a problem, we need a trial, we meet a hardship. We may even commit a sin. I don't want you to think that all we're talking about here is things you can't control. We're talking about some sins here that sometimes are, is the fire. But remember, God's love is eternal. His forgiveness is eternal. And after, on the other side of that mistake you have made, on that failure that you have gone through, on the other side of that, you'll be closer, closer to God and closer to each other. That's why it's our job as the body of Christ while people are going through a failure, while they're going through a huge mistake in their life, we just need to just flood them with love, unconditional love, total acceptance, exactly as they are, and a forgiveness that says, before you ever were born, I forgave you when I died on the cross of Calvary. That's what love is, and that's the gospel, and we should never, ever forget that. On the other side of that mountain is love like we've never experienced it, closeness and unity like we've never uh, experienced it before, and that's what God wants to give to us. I want to talk then for a second here about why love is so powerful. Love is the way... That, that God was before he did anything. Have you ever stopped to think, what did God do before he did anything? I mean, think back, when did he create the first thing he created? Okay, what did he do before that? What did God do? And I would like to suggest to you, if we could put the slide up about the, 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 the Trinity. Next. Okay. That is the next one, number five, hopefully. Okay, can you see it? Okay. The Trinity, before they did anything from eternity, have existed as one God, but somehow expressing themselves as though there were three, but they're not. And I can't explain that. All I'm telling you is don't think of them as three persons. They are not. They are one. Okay? That's really, really important. But they, they just enjoy fellowship. They enjoy relationship. And that's what they did before they did anything. They just hung out together and had a ball. Okay? Have you ever been with somebody? You don't have to have anything to do. You can just talk for ages or share ideas. That's the way I picture God doing. And here we have it like we many times think that it exists. You got God the Father up there at the top, you know, the, the head honcho, God, okay? And then you got God the Son, God the Spirit, sort of on the same level. I want to invite you instead to look at it the way I believe the Bible looks at it, and that's it. Tilt that until it's a horizontal. You've got three distinct aspects of God where he's the Father, where he's the Son, where he's the Holy Spirit, and the Son is always loving the Father 100%. That's what those arrows are. And the Father is loving the Son how much? 100%. The Spirit is loving the Father how much? 100%. And the Father is loving the Spirit 100%. And the Holy Spirit and God the Son are doing the same thing. So you've got this triangle of love that is not 50 50. 
Do you get what I'm saying? Most people think marriage is what? Say it. 50-50. It doesn't work. You know why? Because I always want my 50. And, 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 and I got a different idea as to what my 50 is than Nancy has. Okay? The only thing that works in real love is 100-100, where I'm never looking for anything in return. You say, hey, but that didn't work. People start taking advantage of you. At first, they do. They say, boy, I got a good thing going here. But no matter how badly they, they just mistreat you or take advantage of you, what do you do? You do what God does. God just keeps doing what? How many people are taking advantage of God's forgiveness? Maybe you. All of us have, amen? Okay, so what does God do? He just keeps giving 100%, 100%. And eventually, you know what? Love wins. It did on the cross. Love wins. Because people finally realize that no matter how hard they beat back at God, he never, never rejects them. He always, he always is just giving back 100%. And so we've got love as the ultimate family builder. It is going to forge Forge stronger families because it never expects anything in return. So, I've told you how, just go home and do it, right? Impossible. Impossible. What you have got to do is first understand that no matter how badly you fail at this thing, that God always unconditionally loves you, always accepts you exactly as you are in your sin. I heard all my life that God doesn't save us in our sin. He does, or else none of us would have had a chance. He has to save you while you're a sinner. That's when he died for you, Romans 5, verse 6 through 10. While we're sinners, Christ dies for us. That's the truth about the gospel. And when you grasp that and know that no matter what you do, Jesus has already paid for your sins. That sin that you just committed when he died was on him, and he took it down to the grave and destroyed it. That sin's already destroyed. Can you say hallelujah to that? That sin is gone. You may not see that it's gone, but we don't live by sight, do we? We live by, say it, faith, amen? We live by what? Faith. Not by? Faith. Amen. There's all kinds of sins I see here, but this is not me. This is not me. I am in Jesus Christ, seated on the right hand of the Father, and I am forever there unless I choose to leave. That's what he wants. And that's the love that forges stronger families. Jesus picked up on this when he was here on this earth. A lawyer asked him, and we're on uh, uh, number, pardon me, number seven. Number seven. Uh, a lawyer came and says, which is the greatest commandment? And so uh, Jesus uh, quotes uh, actually the Old Testament, and he says this in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So the first thing we do in our triangle, because our triangle is a lot like the one we just saw up there on the, uh, uh, up on the screen. Our triangle is we've got us We've got our wives, or we've got our church, and then we've got Jesus. And he's in that heavenly triangle, and he pulls us into that triangle of love that loves 100%. And so the first thing we have to do if we're going to forge stronger families with love is we've got to realize that we've got to keep that first commandment. The first four commandments are all summarized in this one. Because notice, he goes down, says the seconds like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then lastly, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The entire Bible, did you get that? 
The entire Bible rests on those two commandments. It is the basis for our creation. Because if we will first love God, we are connected with him. We are being meek. We're letting him control. And the way you do that, here's very important because I want to be real practical. What do you do this week when you want to have stronger families and you want love to do it? What you do is you tell God, I give you all of it. I give you all these sins I haven't conquered yet. I give you my kids. I give you my church. I give you this problem in the church. I give you my sermon this Sabbath. I give you whatever. You give it to him by saying it. You don't do it by feeling it or feeling so powerfully full of faith. You know, too many times my faith is in the toilet. Too many times I want to glorify me, and you will only hear me if I get up here like I normally or naturally am. I've got to give you my voice. I've got to give my heart. I've got to give you and your problems. I can't touch your problems. Your problems are beyond my realm of even understanding. I don't even care enough about you. Do you understand what I'm saying? I am broken only if Jesus takes control. And so I first love the Lord my God with all my heart. You get that. And you do that by simply giving it to him, not by feeling love. Love is not a feeling. It's an action. And so the action I perform is I kneel down before you and I say, God, I can't love you like I should. I don't have the feelings for you. Seems like a bunch of religion to me and just going to church and all that stuff. Right now, I'm going to love you with all my heart by giving you everything in my heart. All my affections, I'm giving it to you. So that's the first step. And now, you're safe. You're in the blacksmith's hands, amen? And now he says, okay, okay, now, love your neighbor as yourself. How much love do you want? Do you want 98%? <laughs> no, you want 100%, amen? So what is God telling you to do? Love your neighbor, what? 100%. Don't worry about you. He that loses his life will what? Save it. You lose your life in loving other people, and you'll find your life. There are a lot of people out there. I talk with so many people. I Uber, so I talk with lots of people, and I've discovered that a lot of people, they'll talk to me about how they've got to find themselves. They've got to focus first on themselves and get straight enough. And I want to just say, boy, good luck on that one. <laughs> the way to find yourself is to lose yourself in loving other people Look at people. Listen to them. That's the way you build stronger families in the church, in your marriage, in your family, and in the world. At your, at your work, you've got to listen to people. You've got to hear what they're... You've got to look in their face and see their pain. He's saying love them. And you know something? When you do that, you'll discover healing will take place. Just as surely as when Jesus was here, what did he do? Go, he went around doing what? Healing people, casting out demons. You'll be doing the same thing. You won't say, demons be gone or anything you know, like that. You won't be saying anything religious, but you'll be accepting them just like they are. And you'll be opening up their hearts for Jesus' healing power to pervade and completely take over their lives. This is what God wants us to do. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. With that understanding, we're going to go to creation because we've had a problem with creation. Creation, we've sort of put in little file boxes. First day, it was the second day. It's just sort of a historical rundown of what was created on which day. But I would like to suggest to you that everything in the Bible is about relationship. Everything. When I first got to preach the very first time, I talked to you about the R word. Does anybody here remember what the R word is? And it's what everything in the Bible is about. Yeah, somebody was listening. Reconciliation. That's relationship. We're all broken, and God is there 
just redeeming our relationship. So when he starts out with the first human couple, he starts out with a week of wrapping up wedding presents. Do you get it? Start thinking about the week. He was wrapping up wedding presents. Let me take you on a little journey here because God is the most creative person in the world, amen? I do not believe, pardon me, I believe they were just sort of, because they couldn't put all what I'm getting ready to do in the Bible. I don't believe it just, okay, God said, let there be light, poof, okay. Okay, now let there be firmament, poof, okay, okay, okay. Did God need seven days to create everything? We know, we know from reading some things and sort of making some conjecture that God probably had a, uh, a, a whole set of planning meetings. He planned where to put this tree. He planned where to put some flowers. He planned how to make cells and muscles and how to design the human body. He had all this plan worked out, how he would create it. All he had really done was had to take his heavenly laptop, push the enter button, and poof, it would have all appeared. Amen? You know, God is not limited and needs a certain amount of time. So why does he take a day for everything? I would like to suggest to you that he slows it all down and wraps it slowly and I believe dramatically. He gathers the angels around to help. He gathers all the other worlds, anybody that's, that, that he's already created. All of them are there and he wants them to see how they were loved when they were created. They couldn't watch their creation, so what does God do? He sets it up so they can watch this creation. And on the first day, he commands a heavenly choir and band and orchestra to gather around. And there are about 93 quadrillion angels with all kinds of instruments and they make a full globe that all the people in the other worlds can actually see through and see what's happening now i want you to understand that the bible makes it real clear that this earth was dark and it was just like a water planet and so he gathers all of those around then he gets some other angels because these are going to be the let there be light angels and they get all over, and they're making another globe in front of them. And he says, okay, is everybody ready? And like a, like a conductor, he says, let there be light. And the music begins to build. Maybe it's like some kind of a concerto or Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or something really, really amazing and mysterious. And all of a sudden, the command is given to one angel in his headphones to just let a little light out of here. How many of you saw the eclipse? Do you remember when it was leaving the eclipse, the diamond that showed up? <laughs> was that not great? That's what happened here. The diamond showed up right here. One of the angels, brilliant, more brilliant than any eclipse, and it lit up the world just a little bit, just a little bit. And as the music moves, another one pops out a diamond. And these little light streams from each angel, they're covering everything else up. Don't know how they do that, but they're covering everything else up. And one at a time, let there be light. And the music is building. And there's more and more in every note, another one pops up. And there's more and more light all around the world until finally, finally, there's this immense emits surrounding circle of all kind of, of, of lights going. And then God takes those lights and he starts a laser show all through the night. And he gets more brilliant and more brilliant until it's daytime because there's so much light. Because remember, he doesn't do anything with the sun, moon, stars till later in the week. So he has to make his own light. And the reason why he makes his own light is he wants them all to see everything that's happening because you see what is he doing folks he is wrapping up a present he's wrapping up a present and on the second day 
On the second day, it says that he makes the firmament. When you read it, it says he takes all that water that's on the earth, just water, and he separates some of it and puts some of it above the sky or firmament, and some of it he leaves as the oceans below. I don't believe he just all of a sudden went, boop, and there it was. Oh, no. He had to make it fun. He had to make it creative. And so he starts fountains going, and the fountains start collecting up here on top until finally, you know, he causes lasers to go down deep in the ocean and explode the water, make it so hot. It explodes and explodes up, and then there's another explosion and another explosion. And all of the people are looking at this water, this amazing water show where the water little by little is collecting up on the roof above the firmament and finally it's all quiet and the second day has ended and then the third day God says let the dry land appear can you imagine it the oceans begin to boil and all of a sudden, the peak of a hill comes up, and everything is just sort of going all over the place. And a huge hill or mountain comes up, and the land comes up. And then as soon as the land comes up, grass starts sprouting up everywhere. You know, and everybody watching and seeing all this stuff. And there's tulips popping up. Boop, 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 and daffodils. Boop, 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 and, and, and knock off roses or whatever they got. You know, all of that beautiful flowers, and then, and then, all kinds of trees. I mean, can you imagine a mighty sequoia? All of a sudden, God lets the music get real quiet. Then all of a sudden, there's like an earthquake. <laughs> and this, this huge sequoia tree starts coming up out of the ground and goes to the sky. And everybody in all the world said, Wow, God, if you ever want to get non-religious but still stay spiritual, start saying, yay, God, wow, God, you know, because that's what we would say. We say, I can't believe it. This was just amazing. On the fourth day, he does something different. He puts everything and wraps everything up in its systems. He makes the way time will be told. I have a feeling that this world up until that time maybe wasn't in a solar system. But now God sort of like a tugboat pulls it over to our solar system and puts it in exact the right place, puts a moon going around it. And then we start going around the sun and then suddenly he has everything perfectly in tune. And then back to the fun again on the fifth day, he said, let there be fish. And he sweeps his hand across the waters and the music rises in this you know, flight of the bumblebee thing, you know, and all of these fish leap out of the water. I mean, millions of them like a school of fish, and there they go, whoosh, and then they land back in, and then here are these huge whales breaching and hitting, and it's just going with the music. All of this is happening, and everybody is saying, wow, God, wow. And then the birds, same happens. God sweeps his hand across the sky, and there's a million parrots in all of their plumage and macaws and, and, and all these birds. I don't know about you, I went up to uh, Kentucky down under, and I got to go in a cage where all these birds would just sit on you. Oh, that was great. But think of it. This was a time when all these birds would have just loved to have gathered around Adam and Eve and sat on them and, and loved on them and Adam and Eve loved back on them. And so at the end of the fifth day, you've got all these birds going everywhere and landing in the trees. You've got all the fish frolicking together and running back and forth. Dolphins doing triple flips out of the water. Amazing. And then the sixth day happens. God does something even neater yet. He starts making playmates playmates, things that Adam and Eve can really play with. I've asked, I can't tell you how many kids, what they want to do when they get to heaven. They talk about, you know, sliding down a giraffe's neck or playing with a, a gorilla or, I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine just all the playmates that God was preparing for them? And we don't know what kind of animals were back way back then. Who knows? But I believe 
God created all of those animals at the nighttime of the sixth day. No scripture for that, by the way. That's in the Don Watson RSV translation. Okay? But full moon out, so everybody can still see. But in the quietness of the moonlight, they see him say, let there be poof, and this thing that looks like an elephant appears. Poof, this thing like an alligator appears. And, you know, all of these things begin to appear as God merely speaks them into existence. So that by time it's dawn, all the animals are created and they're gathered around the, the, the beautiful river of water of life. And God holds his finger up for every animal to be quiet. And he looks up to all the angels and all the orchestra ab above with the angelic choirs. And he holds them up and they are very, very quiet. Not a sound. All you can hear is the squish of Jesus' feet because that's who it is. And he goes down to the riverside and he slips in his hand and pulls out clay and he begins to form the body of Adam. I don't know if he started first with the bones and then did cells. I don't know how he did it. All I know is he wanted to do it differently so that the whole universe would see that this is different. He spoke the light into existence. He spoke the firmament. He spoke the land and the trees and the vegetation. He spoke the birds and, and, and all of that stuff into operation. But now he doesn't speak anything into existence. He gets down and he touches us. He touches us, and he forms us, but he doesn't stop there. He slows it down even more because there, lying before them, is a perfectly formed body of Adam. And God puts his body on top of Adam, arm to arm, finger to finger, mouth to mouth. And the scriptures say that he breathes into his nostrils the breath of of life and man becomes a living what soul the word soul always means the whole person he became a personality in other words when god formed him he gave him a dna it was a dna that included you and included me and so when he's finished he is so excited because you and i were in there we are in there we've all come from adam amen and regardless of the fact that Paul says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ the creator shall what? All be made alive. That's the wonderful good news. And Jesus bends down and he breathes in his nostrils the breath of life and man becomes a living, breathing soul. Then God says something different. After every day, he said, and he looked at the light and said what? It is good. Looked at the firmament at the end of the day, and he said what? It is good. He enjoyed the music. He enjoyed all of the razzmatazz and the laser shows and whatever he had done to make it really, really creative. And at the end, he said, boy, this has been great. Boy, this has been great. Boy, this has been great. But he finishes creating Adam, and what does he say? It is not good that man should be alone. God just make a mistake? <laughs> he said, huh. I need to check my notes. Somebody hand me the book, the creation book. Let me see what I, oh, there's something missing here. No, he didn't. He was doing something very, very special. And it's with, at this particular point, that God decides he's going to give four last gifts. The first is the gift of incompleteness. What did I say? The gift of what? Say it out loud. We most of the time do not think that if something is incomplete, it's more perfect than complete. But he gave Adam the gift of incompleteness because the next sentence, the very next sentence, we're here looking at Genesis actually, uh, 
120, pardon me, 127. Genesis 127. And we find there that it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. He created Adam incomplete because everything in the Bible is about what, folks? Relationship. He was not going to create an Adam that had both male and female, that had all the personality great stuff of a woman and all the personality great stuff of a man and put it into one guy. We don't deserve it, do we, ladies? What he did is he creates Adam and then he gives him a job. We find there in chapter 2, verse 19. Now the Lord God formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. And then it says that he calls Adam to name them all. Why does he change subjects? Not good for man to live alone. Then he brings all the animals to Adam to name. And so Adam starts naming it. Now, I don't know what names he came up. All I know is what we call them now. And he sees these two big old things and he calls them elephants. And these two things he calls them monkeys. And he just loves it to see the two of them playing and, and the two of the elephants rubbing against each other. And he saw two horses and he calls them horses. And they're galloping across the, uh, a field. And, and one by one he goes through and he sees two of this and two of that and two of that and two of that. And suddenly, takes us a while, ladies. Suddenly, he realizes what? Two, two, two. What's up here? Now God's ready. God created him incomplete, so he knew he needed something more. And that's when God puts him to sleep, and he reaches in and it extracts a rib and makes Eve. I want you to realize here what happens. He makes Eve out of a bone from Adam. So where did Eve come from? I'm not talking about men and women here. I'm talking about the fact that, that Adam realized that she wasn't above him. It wasn't a bone from the head. She wasn't below him. It wasn't a bone from the foot. She was a bone from the side. But lest we should think that God did that so that it would show that, they, that we are equal, he did not. He did this so that... Adam would say these words, and he looked her, and he says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is not above me. This is not below me. This is not equal to me or beside me. This is me. This is me. That's why he took out of his rib so that Adam would look at her and say, we are one flesh. The world today wants to separate those two. It wants to shoot us in the foot. And God wants us to realize that if we will allow it in the marriage process, he will cause us to actually be as truly one flesh as Adam and Eve were. And he does that because she, because she came out of a rib, what DNA did she have? The same as Adam. The same as Adam. And what we're talking about here is the two join together and then they become extremely intimate physically and a baby results. And what is in that baby? That baby is made out of both individuals. The twain have become what? One flesh. And if you will live knowing that that is true, regardless of the fact you see another person there, Adam, when he looked at Eve, didn't see somebody that was like a Siamese twin attached to his side. It was, seemed like a separate person. But now God made it real clear that they were one, one flesh. And if you will act that way, if you as husbands will say, why would I hurt my own flesh? Why would I abuse my own flesh? Why would I put myself down? Why would I call myself a jerk? Why would I call myself some horrible, terrible word? Why would, would I hurt this person in any way? This is me. 
this is me. I want you to understand that that is the second gift. He gave him the gift of incompleteness. Then he gives him the gift of oneness. The next thing that the Bible says that happens is that they were naked, but they had no shame. The next thing, if we are going to forge great families in our family, in our marriage, with our kids, in the church, and in the world, we have got to be vulnerable. The, the Bible in the Hebrew actually gives a name, a word that explains physical intimacy where you know someone else physically and you conceive and bear a child. And it's the Hebrew word yada. I don't know if any, anybody here watched uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Anybody here ever watch Jerry Seinfeld? A few of you honest people out there, okay? He was always saying what? Yada, yada, yada. Okay? People didn't know it, but he was... You know, he was saying the word uh, for physical intimacy, and nobody knew it, yet he was just using it for et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what has happened today, by the way, folks. People use the word for physical intimacy as a curse word. I heard a comedian once and say, why do we do that? The most beautiful thing that God gave us, we use it in every horrible way. Why don't we say like, oh, you liar, you, or something like that. That's what she said. I didn't say that, those of you who might be lawyers out there. But all I'm saying is that God put this in a high and holy thing where that is the act, I believe, that actually changes your DNA. When there is the physical union of the marriage partner, he actually changes the DNA. Can you imagine what happens to your body, to the damage you do to your body? When you break that up, that's why it's that what they say often in the marriage ceremony, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. God isn't saying if you do, you're a bad person, and I condemn you, and you're a terrible sinner. He's saying that there's actual hurt, as surely as if you put a plastic bag over your head and couldn't breathe. God created you to breathe air. If you put the plastic bag over, you're free to do that. You've got no condemnation from God. But what's going to happen to you? You're going to either damage yourself or you're going you're to die. What he's saying is the thing that makes things wrong is because they damage you. It's the word for sin, hamartia, which means missing the mark in a bullseye. It's actually an archery term. You miss the bullseye, hamartia. That's what sin is. But we don't know what's a bullseye. Bullseye is God's creation, not his rules. Do you get the difference? Oh, you broke one of God's rules. You defied his authority. And we make it about God. God is unselfish. You know who he makes it about? Us. He makes it about us. And he says, when you do that, you hurt yourself, you damage yourself, you rob yourself of some of the joy that I wanted you to have. Hey, can God heal from the sins we commit? Amen. My wife and I have made so many mistakes in staying together that we exceed what most of you have done in your divorces do you understand what i'm saying my wife and i because we've stayed together for now 47 years a couple weeks ago you know that's wonderful and and there's there are things we enjoy about friendship that you know wouldn't have ever happened if we'd have broken up but folks we didn't have a perfect marriage We messed up time after time again. And what God wants us to understand is that while his forgiveness is there, that there is damage. That's why it's called sin. That's why it's in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not a set of God's rules that you better obey. They're a set of things that says this is the way you were created. And you are not created to commit adultery. When you form that physical union, actually things change inside of you and you become one flesh like you've never been before. Can God heal that and make it work in a second marriage? Absolutely. But the scars will always be there just as surely as if you've got a cut. He doesn't heal the cut so that there's nothing there. The scars are there as well. The third thing then is nakedness. God gives us the gift 
of vulnerability. If we are going to be a church that is the body of Christ, that is the bride of Christ, we need to be vulnerable. We need to be transparent. People must not feel when they come in here, boy, you don't make mistakes in that church. They get on to you if you're wearing this or if you're not wearing that or if you drink this or drink that, don't drink that. If you make this mistake or don't make that mistake, you know, whatever, that must not be what they must feel. Just absolutely oozing from every one of us is a recognition of our brokenness and a recognition of how God has accepted us and therefore we accept you the very same way. Can you say amen to that? That's the gospel. And that's what he wants to give each one of us the gift of. Lastly, he gave them the gift of time. The very next day is what day? The Sabbath. Notice what he did. Genesis 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he did three things. First thing is, it says he rested from all his work. Secondly, it says he blessed the seventh day. And thirdly, he made it holy. Let me ask you a question. He rested. Was he tired? He had had a concert all week long and said, you know, five or six words. You know, let there be light. Poof. You know what happened? I'm not here. Whoa, that was hard work. No, you know, he is not tired. It simply means that there are a lot of things he could have been doing on that day. But guess where he was? Right there with Adam and Eve. So he longs that you too will rest. He longs that you'll not explain away why you can't and that you've got to make money and that you've got to do this. Is he not the creator of the universe? Are not the cattle on a thousand hills his? Do we trust him so little with his power and his wisdom that he can't take care of us? Keep the Sabbath because you, get this, you are actually created to need it in your DNA. As surely as you need water and air and food, you need to keep the Sabbath and rest with God. That was actually put in your DNA, that you depended on God. You rested with him and spent that time with him. Now, when I was growing up, there was a lot said about, you know, guarding the edges of the Sabbath. It all sounded really legalistic to me. Let me tell you what it is. It's relationship. Suppose Nancy is away and she says, I'll be coming on the plane at 8 o'clock. Okay? Where am I at 745? I'll tell you where I am. I'm at that airport, and I'm waiting there. I know she's not coming for 15 more minutes, but I'm looking, and I'm looking. Don't you think that when you were 15 minutes ahead of time, all seated, waiting for the Sabbath to begin, that God looks down and says, hey, that's my child there. That's who that is. That's my child there. Do you see what I'm saying, folks? Because we don't do that, we are powerless. We are not having fun with our Christianity. God wants us to be totally in love with you. But we're not keeping the Sabbath. We're just not working. I thought keeping the Sabbath when I grew up was taking a nap on Sabbath afternoon so you wouldn't do anything wrong. <laughs> no. I've discovered, too, that when you make it right... There's a lot of stuff now I can do that I thought used to think was a sin because I'm doing it with Jesus. I'm with Jesus. I remember I was youth director over in Hawaii, and I just loved it. I had this one Pathfinder leader that had a big group of kids, and on Sabbath afternoon, she took them all out snorkeling, and she had this list of stuff they had to find, and they were having a ball, and the church elders got together and censured her. That's a rule, folks. That isn't relationship. And we are so stuck on rules sometimes that we forget this is about a God who created us and he made us. Now, if there's certain things you choose not to do on Sabbath because you feel it would contribute greatly to your relationship, do it. But don't judge somebody else. 
on what they decide is a great relationship between them and God. Nancy and I eat out on the Sabbath. Some people, they would never come in there. That's the worst sin in the world. But guess what? To me, it means Nancy doesn't have to cook. Doesn't mean she, it means she doesn't have to wash the dishes, or better yet, that I don't have to wash the dishes. <laughs> Do you get my point, folks? What is my purpose for doing whatever it is I do on the Sabbath? To enhance my relationship with God. I'm keeping those two commandments. With all my heart, I'm keeping them. God wants to give us these gifts. It will transform your marriages. It'll transform your families. It'll transform your neighbors your church, and your world. I have a whole list. I'm not going to share it with you, but I'll start out with that. I'm not going to share it with you because I know it's late, but, you know, I've been having too much fun to stop this thing too quickly. But what, I'm, what I want to do is I want to share with you a couple of things, of things you can really do that are in these four gifts. And, and then I want to end with a little short, a little short story. Here it is incompleteness study the book love languages find out who this other person is that is me do you get my picture take some tests to find out what their personality is and what your personality is look for every way possible you can to learn about this other person ask them sometime what is it you need i'd already written up most of this so last night uh i asked nancy i says so Nancy, what do you need from me? Anything I can just do for you. You know, I, wa I want so badly to, to enjoy all of the life that God wants to give us by this 100%, 100% thing. You know what she said? She says, I want to know, if you want to know what I need, I need to know from you what you need. That's what happens. 100, 100. You will never be so loved as when you're not seeking for love. You'll never be so loved as when you're just giving it no matter what. Is sometimes you're going through the fire, yeah, because you think you're the only one that's giving. Well, you know, welcome to God's world. Constantly, he's, only, he's the only one giving to billions of us. That's what he wants to do. Uh, never cut your spouse down in front of others jokingly, or any other way, for that matter. I... I discovered something early in our marriage. We both did. And that's it. We'd get around other couples, and everybody would be joking, cutting up. And, and we'd make little digs at each other. We'd make everybody laugh. Well, that's all you need from me, man. If I get people to laugh some way, you know, I'm going to do it a little bit more. But I saw that sometimes she wasn't laughing. And one time I said, why don't we just promise each other that from now on we will never do that anymore? Now, we've goofed up a few times. But that's something that is really an important part in our mar marriages. Never cut your kids down. If you want them to change something, take them aside. Take them out to lunch or, you know, do something at night. At night, just pray to God when you sit by their bed and say, how was your day? That maybe they'll bring something up that will open the way for you to, to share it with them and explain to them how that goes. Uh, one flesh. Never get comfort from your parents when you and your spouse are having a difficult time. It says that a man will leave his father and mother and cleave. That word cleave is very descriptive. It means chopping something in the half and separating from Do not go to mama and tell her how unkind your wife was. I'll tell you, boy, my wife never did that. You know, she just stayed quiet about it until we learned how to talk. But bless her heart, talking about staying in the fire, you know, finally we discovered how to communicate those things and how to talk about them. But talk about them between the two of you. Yes, it's a forging, but pray to Jesus and just say, if, if all you do is just keep saying, God, help me to have the courage to talk about this. I remember one time I came home from work. I'd been gone all day long, and all day long I was thinking about seeing Nancy. I was getting all, 
you know, romantic and couldn't wait to see her. And I got home and I heard she was upstairs. And so I ran upstairs and as I was running up, she appeared at the top of the steps. And I went up to her and put my arms around her. She ducked out and went downstairs to the kitchen. <sighs> Boy, I was really upset. And I don't know why, but God said, do you want to be right or you want to be happy? And I went into my bedroom and I knelt down by my bed and I said, dear God, you've told me that if I confess my sin, you'll be faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Right now, I'm really mad at Nancy. So I'm asking you to cleanse me. Now, he told me if I asked him, he'd do it, right? Let me tell you how he did it. As soon as I said, please take this thing from me, he said, wasn't a voice, a thought, said, Maybe she had a bad day. Duh. So I go downstairs and go in the kitchen. And she turns around and she's ready for a fight. I can tell. She's got that look on her face. And I said, I guess when you, I went to hug you and you ducked out, I guess that hurt my feelings. Notice that God helped me to, not to say, you know, you shouldn't have done that. There was no attack there. Don't attack. Go ahead and accept that it was my problem. That hurt my feelings. You maybe meant nothing by it. Wasn't your fault at all. It just hurt my feelings when you did that. And I said, I started wondering if maybe you had a bad day. And all of a sudden, the floodgates came down her cheeks. And she said, yeah, it's been pretty bad. And suddenly I discovered I got to know Nancy as a person who's stuck there with kids all day long. No adults to talk to. No play. I had the car. We didn't go to afford two cars. We didn't have Uber. So she's stuck there with two kids all day long. And that's what, that's what was hitting her. I learned about this other part of me. This is me, the two of us. Anthony Campalo arrived on the island of Hawaii at about 2 in the morning, um, their time. It was about um, 9 in the morning, his time. Uh, and he was hungry for breakfast. So he goes into a cafe, and since it's 2 in the morning, there was a group of girls there who were prostitutes who were catching a bite to eat. And he just sits away, but he listens. I want to invite you to take time, like the Sabbath, to listen. Listen to people. He was listening, and one of the girls, her name was Agnes, said, you know, tomorrow's my birthday. Never had a party before? Huh. Never had a cake either. The girl next to her says, what do you want, a medal? No, I was just saying, tomorrow's my birthday. In a minute, I could tell, he could tell that she had gotten her feelings hurt, and she left. As soon as she left, he says, Hey, guys, why don't we throw Agnes a party tomorrow? You know, I'll make a cake, and the, the, the chef said, Oh, no, you won't. He says, I'm the cook around here. I'll make her cake. I said, Okay, okay, I'll get some streamers, and we'll just fix the place all up. And they, everybody got, got excited about doing something. I says, now, sh what time do y'all come in here? Well, we come in here about a quarter till two. Okay, I'll be here then at 1.30 and get, get the streamers up, and, you know, we'll be ready for her when she comes in. So he comes in the next night, gets everything ready. Everybody else does their thing the way they, the cake's all ready. And when Agnes comes in, everybody says, surprise, happy birthday, Agnes. And they all sing happy birthday to her. They light the candles, and she blows the candles out. And then she says, would, would, would y'all mind too badly if I took this home? I've got a little boy, four. He's never seen a birthday cake before. Could I, could I take it home so that he gets a piece? The cook said, sure, Agnes. It's your birthday, your cake. You take it on home. Go ahead. And Kampalo said, Bef before you go, Agnes, could we just have a prayer? And then he started to pray. He didn't wait for a permission. He just went ahead and started having a prayer. And when he finished, the cook looked at him after Agnes had gone out the door and out of earshot. He says, who are you anyway? You one of those church people? What kind of church do you go to? And Anthony Campalo looked at him 
He says, I don't know that I'd have known what to tell you, but now I know that we come from a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at two in the morning. That's who we need to be. We need to listen to the people out there and then bring them to the birthday party here. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your amazing love. Thank you so much for your acceptance of us while we were still sinners. I ask you that as we go from this place that you might help us to forge families by leaving ourselves in your hands and every day just giving everything that we have to you to take care of. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Everybody have a good week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. Oh my goodness. Praise God. He spoke. <laughs>